Chief Justice Chalu, Honorable Judges of the Bombay High Court, Justice Sujata Manohar, Honorable Ex-Judges of the Supreme Court, I am delighted to see Justice Shivraj Patil here in particular. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with a sense of great humility that I stand before you today in a courtroom where Bal Gangadhar Tilak was tried for sedition 108 years ago. We see his portrait standing here. The word sedition was therefore never used by our founding fathers, by another great founding father, Dr. Ambedkar, who you see here. And advisedly, what was used was security of state in Article 192, about which there will be a little more later. But what is interesting is, it is these great, great persons, like Balgandhada Tilak, who led to our freedom struggle, which in turn led to the fundamental rights that we all cherish so deeply. The great dissenters of the 50s and 60s are really persons who have chiseled these rights for us and have made them meaningful because in Charles Evans use great words, they have really as a dissent in a court of last resort, appeal to the brooding spirit of the law and to the intelligence of a future day, so that the intelligence of that future day ultimately takes the dissent at what it is and makes it into law. What is interesting is that in the civil law tradition of which the court Napoleon is a part, a dissenting judgment is an exercise in futility for the simple reason that the civil law tradition does not believe in precedent. So it is enough that you actually interpret a particular code on the facts of a given case and, and deliver judgment. However, we are followers of the common law tradition and that tradition basically had judgments delivered seriatim, which only means that assuming you were five judges sitting on a bench, each of you would be entitled and each of you would in the old days deliver your individual judgment. We have had instances of that happening in our Supreme Court in combinations of five and seven. And they don't conduce to much clarity. So, we really have two interesting opinions about dissenting judgments in our common law tradition. And I must tell you before I go to those two divergent views, that the US Supreme Court really started out with this seriatim practice, which you will find in their early judgments like Chisholm versus Georgia, etc., 1793. But until the great chief, Chief Justice Marshall, came and put his stamp on US constitutional law for a period of 34 years, this practice got rooted out. What he did was to deliver in a slow and monotonous tone of voice the judgment of the court in 90% of the cases. He, did, he dissented actually only once. And it is that practice that was followed for a long time until you had fractured Supreme Courts of the type we have today of five and four, one way and four, five speaking, one way and four speaking, the other. But two great American judges, one Chief Justice Hughes, who in a lecture delivered in 1928 to the Columbia Law School, put forth this intelligence of a future day theory. And the exactly opposite theory was put forward by Louis Brandis, who perhaps was an equally great judge and who served the institution for 23 long years. And he said in Burnett versus Colorado, which is a 1932 judgment, that it is more important 
that something we settle, then it be settled right. Now, all of us have been used to the Privy Council judgments, which was our Supreme Court, so to speak, before the Constitution came into force. It will interest you, it will interest you to note that not a single Supreme Court judgment has a dissent in it. And the reason is that it goes back to a note made in the time of Charles I, a note made in 1627. Because the Privy Council really was what it says it is, a council that is privy to the king. They were really a group of ministers who also had to undertake the king's judicial duties. And what they did therefore was to tender advice to the king, which continued. Now, when you tender advice, it does not conduce to the clarity of that advice if there are differing voices speaking. So it was always a tradition with the Privy Council that they delivered usually one judgment which spoke for the entire bench. Justice, Chief Justice Gajendra Gadkar's autobiography gives us an interesting insight into this. He spoke of Justice M.R. Jaikar, who became a judge of the federal court and then a judge of the Privy Council and had to decide the question of Hindu law. Now, Justice Jaikar sat with three of his brethren, all of them Englishmen. And when the, the arguments concluded, Justice Jaikar was of, was of one particular view and the three Englishmen were of another particular view. So it was decided that the majority view would be written. And written by who? None other by just, than Justice Jaikar himself. So Justice Jaikar had actually to pen a view, which he did not believe. And this was the practice that was followed by this August court. On the other hand, when we come to our court, we find that in a very early judgment, the Delhi Laws Act, delivered in 1950, all the seven judges who sat on the bench delivered judgments. And it was in musical terms a complete cacophony because one could not therefore discover an issue. And it took Justice Vivian Bose's brilliance five years later in Rajnara and Singh's case to devise a new rule of precedent for this. And that new rule was that you look to the minimum that a particular judge has said and that other judges have built upon. And if you were to query the other judges, they'd say, of course, to the minimum, but they've gone further. So therefore, the minimum becomes the ratio. Now, it is this cacophony that Brandis spoke about. In fact, Alexander Bickel has published a volume which is very interesting reading. Of all the dissents of Louis Brandis, which never in fact became dissents, because he felt that you only dissented if you had to dissent and you were so strongly of the view that your view was right that you would put it forward. Some of his notable dissents are in the area of privacy, in the area of free speech, of which he was a great champion. For Harvard Law Review, which is an article which Brandes wrote in 1890, actually is the fountainhead for all privacy law that comes thereafter. Now, each of these great men, Hughes on the one side and Brandes on the other, were persons of very vast experience in so many walks of life. Charles Evans Hughes started out as a brilliant lawyer in New York, ran for the office of governor twice, was elected governor of New York twice, was then appointed on the Supreme Court of the United States in 1910 and served for six years. After which, like Chief Justice Subarao here, he resigned in order to run for president. He ran for president, lost, then continued his great law practice until Warren Harding in 1920 made him Secretary of State of the United States. This office he filled for four years and after he demitted, he was appointed as a permanent judge on the Hague Court. At that point of time, there was the League of Nations. And when that 
tenure came to an end. He finally became Chief Justice of the United States in 1930. After William Howard Taft, who himself had been President of the United States and later became Chief Justice. This great man was 67 years old when he was appointed Chief Justice, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, and served as Chief Justice for 11 years. Now, it was this experience which led him to pen in these few words the importance of a dissenting judgment. The other view, an equally legitimate view of Justice Brandis, was again by an extraordinarily brilliant person. I have already told you that he was not only a Harvard professor, but for Harvard Law Review is the one article one goes back to the moment you speak of privacy. He was also the master of what was called the Brandis Brief, which meant that he prepared his facts and got facts marshaled in such a way that the inevitable conclusion would have to be on those facts. Which is why he said it's more important that the law be settled than it be settled right. It's the facts that really determine everything. This we've seen in the Delhi Law's case, as I pointed out to you, and we also saw it during the emergency in the Indira Gandhi case, where a constitution bench consisting of five of the senior judges, each of whom delivered a particular judgment, telling us what he thought was the basic structure of the constitution, which had been laid down by a bench of 13 only two years ago. But short of these two, we find that there are a number of individual solo dissents, some of which were not only brilliant, but had such foresight that they astonish one when one reads them today. Now, one such, and perhaps the greatest dissent of them all, is Justice Fazal Ali's dissent in Gopal. But before that, let me tell you that the first court, which consisted of eight judges, the strength was eight, had a court which was first bodily lifted out of the old federal court. Six learned judges, S.R. Das being the sixth who had been appointed a few days before, were picked up from the federal court and in fact made judges of this court. Chief Justice Kanya headed it. And but for an untimely death, the other three who were immediately after him, short of Justice Fazal, would never have become Chief Justice. It would have gone straight to SRS. Followed by him was the great Fazal Ali, whose descent I will speak about. In fact, his is an amazing record. He put in only two years as a judge. Uh, Eight months of those two years being as an ad hoc judge because he joined when he was 63. And in those two years, he delivered six dissents. And of the six dissents, three became law. So this was really an outstanding man. Apart from him, you had Patanjali Shastri who came next, who had the encomium of being a dissenter as a Chief Justice the very first time. After Patanjali Shastri, you had the great tiger, Nechan Mahajan, who dissented off. And after him, you had the gentle, scholarly, and brilliant B.K. Mukherjee, who also became Chief Justice and died in that post. And of course, S.R. Das, who became our Chief Justice later. But added to these six, which was the first call, you had Justice Chandrasekhar Iyer, and then the great Vivian Bose was the eighth. And in this first court, we already have two of the greatest dissenters that this court has ever known. Justice Fazal Ali and Justice Bose. Justice Fazal Ali came from a family, legal family in Patna, served as Chief Justice, and is perhaps the only judge that I know of who has continued both his Chief Justice after retirement age was reached and made an ad hoc judge after he reached the age of 65 in the Supreme Court. 
Gopalan's case was one of the very first things that hit this first bench. And it was a preventive detention case of a communist. It raised many, many vital questions of constitutional law. The most important question that it raised was, what exactly is the content and reach of Article 21? Article 21 was couched in a form somewhat different from the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment of the United States. And both majority and minority deliberated on what it meant. The other very important point that arose before the court was whether you had to look at each fundamental right article-wise as a watertight compartment or whether they fertilized each other, so to speak. On both these counts, Justice Fazal Ali was way, way before his time. The majority held that Article 21 having been borrowed from the Japanese constitution, which was a new constitution, 1946, and having used the colorless words, procedure established by law, is colorless in content. Procedure established by law would have to mean statutory law. And the moment a statute, like the Criminal Procedure Code, occupied the field, by and large, that was the end of your challenge. They also held that we cannot read Article 21 along with 22 or along with 19, particularly 19.1b, which deals with movement throughout the territory of India. And they said, that if you look at Article 22 by itself, either this law conforms with Article 22 or it doesn't. And given this colorless interpretation, of course it conforms with Article 22. And that was the end of the matter. But Justice Fazal Ali would have none of this. Justice Fazal Ali painstakingly traced the due process clause of the United States from Magna Carta, went on into a statute of Edward III, went on into the Bill of Rights of 1628 and finally told us how this particular language was picked up and put into the Fifth Amendment by James Madison, the fifth president and the founder of their constitution. And the due process clause therefore was used to invalidate acts of Congress. It took about 60 to 70 years later after the Civil War to have the 14th Amendment, where the same result would ensue for the states. Now, what was this due process clause? The due process clause simply said that no one should be deprived of his life, liberty or property, except by due process of law. Originally, due process of law meant that the procedural part of the law had to be valid. If there was something wrong with it, then you could strike down the law, but not otherwise. In America, thereafter, you had what was called the Lochner era, named after a very famous case of 1905, in which the US Supreme Court's greatest dissenter, Justice Holmes, gave a one-page stinging dissent. Now, Justice Rufus Beckham, who spoke for the court, essentially said that here we have a statute of New York which prescribes certain minimum hours that persons would work in factories. Question was whether that would pass muster under the due process clause. Justice Peckham said no because it interfered with the liberty of contract of both the employer and the employee. And therefore, this clause would be struck down for the first time on what we lawyers call substantive as opposed to procedural term. The Lochner era, so to speak, continued through in 1937 when the veiled threat of President Roosevelt finally made the court switch from five to four, striking down New Deal legislation 
two, five to four, the other way around. And substantive due process, therefore, had its untimely death in 1937. So that in 1946, when the Japanese constitution was framed, and mind you, Justice Fazabani tells us that it was really an American constitution. Because post Douglas MacArthur, it was American experts who came down and drafted the entire constitution. And the words procedure established by law, which is in that Japanese constitution, was purposely introduced by the American draftsman because he wanted to say yes, due process, but limited to its procedural side. We don't want substantive due process, which now has died. All this Justice Fazalani painstakingly traced and therefore said, the mere fact that due process of law has not been used doesn't mean much. Procedure established by law is due process of law, in point of fact. It just so happens that the present trend of American decisions is that it will not include a striking down on substantive grounds. Having said this, he then went on further to say that therefore law does not merely mean statutory law. Law means something much more. Law can be principles of justice. It can be principles contained in other charters as well. And secondly, that this law has to be a valid law. Most importantly, Justice Fazalani also dissented on the other law and said that according to him, every preventive detention law directly impedes free movement. Now, free movement is contained in Article 191D. The majority got rid of 191D very simply by saying, look, it's a preventive detention law. We go by Article 22, which is a watertight compartment. Justice Fazalani would have none of this. He said, not only do the safeguards in Article 21, 22, which are procedural safeguards, not only do these have to be followed, but substantively also the law must satisfy the reasonable restriction in public interest test, which we find in Article 19.5. So, this first judgment that was delivered had a brilliant judgment by this brilliant judge, which was way ahead of its time. Of course, things were set right 20 years later in R.C. Cooper first, which was an 11 judgment, which echoed what Justice Fazalani said about reading all the fundamental rights together and not in watertight compartments. And eight years later, the celebrated judgment in Manika Gandhi's case, which now lays down the law as we know it, which is that the law should not merely be procedure established by law, but should be just, fair, reasonable as well. And with this, of course, we have the host of other rights now, which have been put under Article 21. So much for that first remarkable judgment. Shortly after that judgment was delivered, he delivered two other great judgments, both of them dissents. One in Romesh Thapar and one in Bridge Bhushan. Those again were judgments which had to do with a core area of our fundamental rights, free speech. The majority found that both the statutes that were spoken of in those judgments, one was an East Punjab statute and the other was a Madras statute, both of them dealt essentially with cases of public disorder. And according to them, since public order was not a separate head in Article 19.2, those laws would pass muster. Justice Fazalani said no. He said sedition was not used advisedly because sedition did not include public order. Well said. But what was in fact used was security of state, which is a wider concept that takes within it public order. And not only had the ink not run dry on those two dissents, but the very constituent assembly now acting as the first parliament, under Article 379, 
it was made the first parliament. Immediately undid the effect of the majority by passing the constitution first amendment time, in which it added the words public. So we've seen, therefore, that three out of these six great dissents became law. Two immediately, and the other, which was so way, way before, yeah, way, way ahead of its time, took 20 years and 28 years, respectively. There's one other interesting dissent that he wrote in Keshavan Madhav Menon's case. It's a, again a very early 51 decision, in which the question was whether a press emergency act prosecution against a newspaper man could continue after the constitution because that particular law became invalid once it was tested on the ground of the new 1918. The majority had no because they said the prosecution was begun before 1950 and therefore could continue. Justice Fazanali painstakingly went through every single article of the constitution and said that the word void which is used in article 13.1 is used in only one other article. And there are many, many other words of different use which are used. But the most powerful and pungent of the lot was the word boy, which meant that it was still born. And he said that the moment, therefore, a prosecution was launched under this particular act, which as a result of Article 19.1a coming into force after the constitution, has now become still born in his words, the prosecution cannot be. We now come to our second great dissent, Vivian Bose. Vivian Bose is to refer to himself as a Mongol for the reason that his mother was English, his father Bengali, and his wife American. In point of fact, his father-in-law John Mott won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1946. Now, this multifaceted personality believed in many things other than the law. Photography, magic are only two of the other small things that he pursued. He was also an avid car driver and drove all the way to London in 1932 alone from here and did the return trip in 1956 at a point of time when there was a gap between the time he retired and the time he was inducted again as an ad hoc judge. This man's felicity with the language is well known, but what is not really appreciated, and by the way, none of his dissents became known, but what is not appreciated is his feel for the spirit of the constitution. In a very early preventive detention case, in Ram Singh's case, he started off by saying, I am going to plow a lonely furrow. And then went on to say that you must get past all the verbiage and go deep into the heart and spirit of the constitution. And what does it tell us? It tells us that it was born from the freedom struggle. That's the first very important point in it. And being born from the freedom struggle, it is something that one must cherish because we have adopted what he called simply as the free way of life. And it is this free way of life that we are now going to train. Therefore, get past all the verbiage. Ask a judicially trained mind, is this something fair? If it is not fair, strike it down. And in Ram Singh's case, therefore, he began with striking down a preventive detention law which amended that first act. Section 11 of that law said that even though an advisory board which has to say that your detention order is good within a period of three months. So even though the advisory board says that your detention order is good, yet parliament which is supposed to fix an outer limit only fixed as an outer limit the fact that the, ex the executive can fix whatever limit it likes. The majority upheld it on the specious ground that this is a temporary act that is going to fizzle out itself the next year. Justice Bose would have none of this. 
and struck down section 11 of that act and consequently the detention. Another very early and beautiful decision of his is reported in S. Krishna, again a 51 judgment. And here again he dissented, again in a preventive detention case. And again with a provision that ultimately did not provide for a, a limit to the period to which a person could be detained. He likened it to a person being stuck in the Bastille. Now the Bastille is the symbol of the French Revolution. The storming of the Bastille on 14 July 1789 is what propelled freedom on earth really. And even though there were only some five prisoners left in the Bastille, most of them had rotted and died for years and years being in solitary confinement. The great war cry of the French Revolution, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, was really from that day onwards. And that is equally the war, for, war cry of our constitution. If you see our preamble, they use these very words. Liberty of thought, expression, belief, worship, equality of status and opportunity, and finally, the most important of all, fraternity. In today's day particular, fraternity. Which ensures the dignity of the individual first. And as a result, the unity of the nation. So, it is these values that Vivian most felt very deeply. And expressed in language more beautiful than any of us can conceive. The next case, the next case, in fact, another great dissent was in the cases which came from West Bengal and which concerned Article 14, the equality provision. And one was Anwar Ali Sarkar, one was Kanshari Haldar. Both of them dealt with special courts acts by which certain serious offences could be picked out and tried not only by a special court but without the usual safeguards. He dissented in both these judgments and basically said that we have chosen the free way, our constitution must be good for, as he beautifully put it in BD supply years later, the butcher, the baker and the candlestick baker, which is that is for you, it's for me. It's not for lawyers, it's not for judges, it's for ordinary citizens. And in Kansari Haldar, he spoke of the concept of reintroducing a star chamber into this land. The star chamber incidentally was something which had its origins in the Tudor dynasty. If you read English history, you find that a French dynasty, in fact, at no point since 1066 has the English been ruled by the English. They've been ruled by the French, they've been ruled by the Welsh, they've been ruled by the Scots, finally by the Germans. So we had this long period from William the Conqueror, right after the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, when Richard III was the last Plantagenet king, was finished. And Henry VII, who is the first Tudor king, comes in. Within two years, he introduces what is called this star chamber, which took its name from the stars on the ceiling. And this chamber was really to introduce justice back into the law, because by then, the nobles were more or less above them. And Henry VII, the new king, the Welsh king who came, wanted to enforce the law against the rich and the poor alike. So it started very well on a good foot. But then, given his despotic son, Henry VIII, and given Elizabeth later, the Star Chamber degenerated into an instrument of oppression until it was finally abolished in the time of Charles I in 1641. And it was this Star Chamber that Bose was speaking of, this latter day Star Chamber, in which arbitrary punishments were inflicted on all and such. So it is 
conceptually beautiful to see how these early judges used their knowledge of history. We we'll see that judges like Justice Hidayatullah also used their knowledge of Greek mythology apart from other things. But these early judges used well-known concepts in English law in order to buttress what they thought would be going down a wrong corridor, as Justice Booth put it. Another interesting dissent comes to mind. In a judgment delivered in 1958, State of UP versus Muhammad Nu. Now, interestingly enough, Muhammad Nu's case concerned itself with whether Article 226 was retroactive or whether it would apply only after the constitution came into force. You had, in this case, a deputy superintendent of police who conducted a departmental inquiry. Now, he was judge in that inquiry and at one point he found that a particular witness had turned hostile and there was no other witness. So he stepped down from the roster, became witness himself, recorded his own evidence and came back. And Justice Vivian Bose put it very picturesquely saying that this would thrill an audience of a Gilbert and Sullivan opera but would hardly conduce to fairness in departmental inquiry practice. Another interesting judgment or judgments really are in that last eight months when he was called back as an ad hoc judge. One of those judgments is a beautiful judgment reported in K. Srinivasan where he used the expression out Shylock in Shylock for the courts this time, saying that the government themselves realized that they had caused a certain injustice to this particular person, Mr. Srinivasan. But the courts were out Shylock in Shylock and giving him nothing. And he then went on to say that it's very important to realize that judges don't make law, yes. But what they do is to mold present situations in such a manner that old laws fit them, put very beautiful. And the last judgment that he really delivered was the most picturesque of all, Tisco versus the Union of India. Again I said, the question was whether the doctrine of territorial nexus would sustain a particular state law when it wanted to tax a sale. And what it did was, instead of taxing the place where the goods finally were found their reports, it caught one of the, 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 one of the aspects of a transaction of sale and said, that's good enough for us to tax. Justice Bose would have none of this. He likened it to a group of hungry hawks swooping down on a sale like a human body and grabbing some part of a quivering liver, some part, some other talent and he put this very beautiful and ultimately ended by saying some say, some hawks, which again takes us to Churchill and Churchill's great Ottawa speech which he made on the 30th of December in 41 in the middle of the world war in which Marshal Pétain had apparently told the French Premier after the Battle of France was over that England would be devoured and its neck cut like a chicken by the German forces. At which point Churchill said some chicken, some neck because by then they had staved the German Operation Sea Lion off. The other interesting thing that he spoke of in this disco judgment was to liken a sail to a dog and said, you can't just catch a dog and say, I am taxing the dog when actually you are taxing its tail or you are taxing its head or you are taxing some other part of its body or you are taxing where the owner should have been. And ultimately said, sorry, that this law cannot pass muster. Interestingly enough, the dog has crept into the law reports, otherwise than in the Tisco judgment. 
in an interesting judgment in 1934, two king's men, page 35, Whitehall, Smith and Company versus Chaplin. The king's men and Lord Justice Scruton and Lord Justice Mom came from the Court of Appeal to sit on the king's men. Had to decide on what was meant by the word goodwill in a particular landlord tenant statute. So, Lord Scruton very picturesquely put it thus. He said, if I were to describe it as dog goodwill, what would it mean? It would obviously mean that what is important is the master and not the place. If I were to describe it as cat goodwill, the exact opposite would obtain. And if I were to describe it as rat goodwill, it would be as if there were no goodwill at all. Because a rat just scurries around and doesn't really catch what it's supposed to. To these three animals was added a rabbit by Lord Justice Mom in the other judgment, saying that you have forgotten the rabbit because the rabbit is the person who goes to the closest Kirana shop possible. So with this, we end the great descents of Justice Vivian Bose. Unfortunately, as I told you, none of them really appealed to a future day and none of them ever really became part of our The third great dissent and perhaps the greatest of all is Justice Subarao. Now, Justice Subarao began tentatively and I must tell you that he belonged to a family of three chief justices. His brother-in-law Rajabhanar, his brother-in-law's father who was Chief Justice of Mysore and himself. And he of course went on to become Chief Justice of India. Now, Justice S.R. Das as Chief Justice was given a farewell function. And there is a very interesting speech that he makes in which he describes each of his colleagues. And for Justice Subarao, he said, Justice Subarao is a judge who is of the view that the fundamental rights of this country are going to the dogs because of some ill-conceived judgments by his president. And there he was right because this man really stretched for what he conceived to be the importance of fundamental rights. An early judgment is in Rajeshan Dhare's case in 59, where he presaged Kripak in 1970 by reading into a statute natural justice. Another very interesting judgment, again early, is whether 191A would prevail over legislative privilege under Article 194. And in MSN Sharma's case, what happened was that the editor of Searchlight had printed something that actually happened in the Vidhan Sabha. And the Vidhan Sabha took it up and said, you have not printed it correctly and hold them up. And the question was whether what he had printed would pass muster under 1918. The majority said no. We apply the general versus special test. 191A is general. It applies generally to citizens. Whereas 194 applies only to legislators. And therefore, through Sharma, Justice Subara would have none of this. And Justice Subara therefore said, and quite correctly, that what we must really see is that privileges themselves are a subject mentioned in list 2, entry 39. And suppose at the moment a state legislature were to make a law which codified its privileges. That law being subject to the other provisions of the constitution would be subject to 1990, state of it. But the mere fact that the legislature had not made such a law and that the House of Commons privileges would continue until that law was made would not make the position any different. The majority of course got over it by saying this is not a transitory provision, which Justice Subara said it was. But a provision which, as I told you earlier, was according to them special as opposed to 1919 Indian. Some sucker can be had for this judgment, this dissent, because in the 1965 judgment of Chief Justice Gajendra Gandhi, 
the great reference case where the confrontation between the Allahabad High Court and the Vidhan Sabha there led to a presidential reference which was answered by the Supreme Court. Ultimately, the majority judgment was at least contained. It had to be followed because that was also a bench of five. But though not expressly approving of Justice Subhara's view, it was contained. Another early dissent of Justice Subhara is when he struck down Section 27 of the Evidence Act in State of UP versus Dioman Opadhyay in 1961. And here, he had to interpret Article 14 and he broke it up into its constituent elements, telling us that equality before law comes from the Irish constitution borrowed from England, which is a negative concept, put it well. And the equal protection of the laws comes from the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution, which is a positive concept. And ultimately he held in that judgment that if you are in police custody, then it is all right. Your admission, of course, cannot be looked at. But if your admission leads, leads to a bloodstained knife somewhere, and that bloodstained knife is found after a DNA test to be yours, you can be convicted. But on the other hand, if you are not in police custody, the whole thing would be out. So therefore, Article 14 breached, I would strike down the section. The majority, of course, of him. And therefore, people with bloodstained knives still get convicted, even though there may be no other proof. This then leads to another facet of Justice Subhara's mindset. On federalism, again, he was very pro-state. He was pro-state against it, one of the few judges. And one of his early judgments on federalism was the Gujarat University case, a 1963 judgment, where the Gujarat University has pres had prescribed Gujarati as an excluded, exclusive medium of instruction. The majority, Justice Shah speaking for the majority, struck it down and said mediums of instruction particularly in institutions of higher learning, like the university, would go straight to NP66 list 1, being coordination and determination of standards for education. And on a rather straight construction, struck it down. Justice Subhara would have none of this. And said, no, NP11, which at that point of time was in the state list, was good enough to speak of all education, including higher education, and coordination and determination of standards had nothing to do with language being a medium of instruction, and therefore it would be well within the state legislature's power to pass this law. This is the only case of a dissent, which I know, which not only did not become law, but for which a constitutional amendment was passed to see that no such dissent would ever arise in the future. Because we find from the 42nd Amendment, education was taken out of this two and put into the Tattarakas to see that no such dissent would ever come in future. Apart from this, one of the most important judgments that the court had delivered was State of West Bengal versus the Union of India. And here, what arose was as to whether the Union could acquire lands belonging to the states. There was a coal bearing areas act which was passed by the centre. And coal being a mineral belongs to the state. So it was acquired on the payment of some pittance as compensation. The majority after painstakingly going through our constitution, just just Sina speaking for the majority, went into how we are really quasi unitary, not even quasi federal and said that the four tests for a really federal constitution are number one, something like the United States where sovereign nations give up part of their sovereignty to become part of a United States. Two, that the amendment of a federal constitution can only take place by the states or with their consent. Three, that a judiciary Federal judiciary is empowered not only to interpret the constitution but to strike down 
federal laws and ultimately for which was that you have a separate court system like in America, you have a state system, you have a federal system. And even though he found, Justice Subarao found that three is present but one, two and four are not, he went into political theories and said that the sovereign really is the people of India. Therefore, political sovereignty rests with them. Legal sovereignty, on the other hand, is given by the constitution to these two great organs, one the center, two the states. And each is sovereign in its sphere. Now, if each is going to be sovereign in its sphere, obviously, one sovereign cannot gobble up the land of the other. And therefore, he came to the conclusion that short of an agreement, entry 42 list 3 will not avail the Union of India. This again was a great blow struck in favor of the states, but which never ultimately fortified. And with this, we now come to the fourth great dissenter of this era, Justice Hidayatullah. Justice Hidayatullah was a very colorful personality and straddled three decades. He was appointed in 59, he demitted office in 1971. He also straddled three offices because not only was he Chief Justice of India, he was acting president and then vice president as well. He was one of the very young advocates general to be appointed in Nagpur and had one of the longest tenures on the court as well. I think at 12 or 13 years. And perhaps Justice Bhagwati and Justice Chandrakur had longer tenures. But this man's dissents again appealed to the brooding spirit of the law and to the intelligence of a future day and did become law later. One such example is in the New India Sugar case in 1963, where the learned judge went into Roman law and said that Justinian had to decide as to whether a particular sale, being a compulsory sale, false sale, was nonetheless a sale. And why was it false? Because the price was fixed by a third party. Neither the offeror nor the offeree could fix price. Ultimately, Labio fought against Proculus and Proculus won, which meant that the sale was nonetheless a sale. And therefore, following that, he said, Justinian was one of the greatest law waivers, could not possibly have won one. I followed. And despite the fact that the sale year was an essential commodities act sale, where the seller was picked up by the controller, the buyer picked up by the controller, price fixed by the controller, he said, nonetheless, it's a sale and can be taxed. This dissent ultimately became law in Vishnu agencies. That would be about 12 to 14 years later. Chief Justice Chandra stood at that point writing for the majority. Another very interesting judgment of Justice Hidayat Tundas is the judgment dealing with offer and acceptance in contract. Bhagwan Das Kedia. Here again he was in dissent. And section 4 of our contract act says that a contract is complete as against the acceptor the moment it's put in a course of transmission to the proposal. So you can't revoke that up. But the whole question there was, this was a telephone contract. This was not a contract set by post. So the majority said that section 4 stricto sensu will not apply to a telephone contract. After all, it's an 1872 provision. And it's as if the parties were face to face. And they followed Lord Denning's judgment in the Entos case, which was a telex case, where one picturesque example given by Justice Lord Justice Denning was, that suppose you stand, the offerer stands here, the acceptor stands across, and there is a river between them. And some noise comes and drowns out the acceptance. Would you say the contract is complete? Obviously not. So the majority went by that. Justice Hidayatullah went into the law in the greatest possible detail, law 
nation and nation after nation was scoured to find out what their law was. And ultimately found that there were three types of laws. One like our section form, one where it was complete only where it was finally received order, and one which was a hybrid situation. That it had to be communicated, heard, and then ultimately would relate back to the time that it was communicated. But anyway, finally he found in Bhagwanda's Kerya's case that we have a section for it is not limited to post, we have to follow it strictly. And this brings us to Naresh Miracha. Again, one of his most beautiful descents, he dissented, he was the signal dissenter in a bench of either. And the question that arose really came from this court. Justice Tarkunde passed an order, which was an oral order. In a case which involved Mr. Karanjia of Blitz, and there was a witness who said that I am being lampooned daily by the press. So see that the press cannot publish what is happening in the witness box. And Justice Tarkunde orally said, all right, yes. Mr. Karanjia went up to the Supreme Court instead of going in appeal in an Article 32 petition and petitioned the court saying that my 191A right has been infringed by this particular judge of this particular high court. The majority said, a superior court of record can never infringe a fundamental right. What's wrong with you? Justice Hidayatullah said, no. He went again painstakingly into all the American judgments first, then went into our Article 12, which defines state which is, by the way, is an inclusive definition. And then said, of course, the judiciary can violate fundamental rights. What's Article 20 all about, for example? It is aimed only at the judiciary. He then said that high courts in this country are subordinate to the Supreme Court. I'm not very sure whether he was right there. But he said, therefore, a writ of certiorari could go from a higher court to this lower court which is the high court, and then be no problem. Ritz in his picturesque language can go up, down, but not sideways. So a high court cannot issue a writ to her. But then the question remains, suppose the Supreme Court itself were to pass such a law. Under Article 32, no such writ could issue. But anyway, that was again one of his great dissents. There is remarkable reasoning in it. And all in all, he was again a judge who was a thinking judge because he came out with very interesting things as I told you in Greek mythology in this judge. He spoke of a Procrustean bed. He also spoke of a Sisyphean task. Now Procrustes was the son of the god Poseidon, who was the sea god. And a Procrustean bed is a bed which a person is made to fit into. If your legs are too long, Procrustes saws them off. And if you are too short, you are stretched into the bed. So the point is that you are inflexible. And the other interesting thing he spoke about was a Sisyphean task. Now Sisyphus was the king of Corinth who was condemned and condemned because of some wrong he had done to roll a boulder up a hillside. And every time it rolled the boulder and the boulder reached the top, the boulder come down again. So Sisyphus would have to start all over again. So in short, a Sisyphian task is an impossible task. So there are many things which pepper these judgments with this kind of learning which makes them very interesting. In another judgment, for example, in the Abbas case and in the other uh, Lady Chatterley lover's case, where he followed the Hitlin test. He went into the law of obscenity from the very beginning and said it really started with some rape called Sir Charles Sedley in Charles II's time, who bared his bottom at some tavern and was sued for obscenity from which this law is now finally derived. Anyway, with that, one can go on and on of course, but with that I think we've come to the end of this evening. I can only end by saying that perhaps the greatest dissent of all, not for its forensic learning, 
But for the sheer guts that it showed when the chips were done, was the great Justice Khanna's descent in the ADM double process. He ended, by the way, with the words of Charles Evans. And it didn't take long for his judgment to become law because the 44th Amendment amended Article 359 and made it clear that Article 21 cannot now be suspended during an internal emergency. Of course, we live in Kali Yu, things are all upside down. So, the three persons who should not have become Chief Justice became Chief Justice. Justice Khanna, who should have become Chief Justice, was superseded for this judgment. And I can only end by telling you that we have hope because of Nani Palkiwala's great article on this super session. I never forget the ringing words with which it ended. It ended by saying, to the stature of such a man, the Chief Justiceship of India can add nothing. Thank you all very much.